trickle in. All right, so um, welcome to this week's Engineering Basics. This is the second presentation in a weekly series. Um, hopefully everyone was able to connect to Discord. Um, if not, the link should be up there in the top corner, um, hopefully next to my face. Um, today, we will be talking, we'll be continuing our review of statics basics. Um, we'll be doing a couple problems, on, a couple practice examples on static equilibrium. Then we'll talk about distributed loads. And if we have time, we might cover friction, but I, I don't think we'll really have time for that. All right, so we'll get into it. Um, just as a, a kind of review from last week, um, the, the three most important equations that we have in statics are these three fundamental laws. Um, and these are all derived from physics. So these all come from Newton's first three laws. So um, the, basically the idea is that um, the, uh, in any direction and at any distance, uh, every reaction has an equal and opposite reaction. So that means that for any given situation that you model, the sum of your reactions or the sum of your forces in any direction, and you can think of this as in vector directions as well, the sum of your forces in any direction is going to be equal to zero. Um, one, uh, one thing, one consequence that comes out of that is we like to draw diagrams. So in statics, and we, we kind of talked about this last time, but I want to go over these a little more formally. Um, are what are free body diagrams? So a free body diagram is just some picture we use to describe our situation. It's got forces on it. It's got coordinate directions. It has whatever our object is. So this is our, our potato of science here. Um, and then we want labeled coordinate system. So we'll show that in green. Um, do y and x, and then however many forces and reactions we have. Um, and the whole point of a free body diagram is to both for us, the problem solvers, and for anyone that might be reviewing our work to communicate pictorially what the system we're describing is, to both communicate what's going on and to kind of help us visualize and think about what we're solving. Um, so that begs the question, how do you make a free body diagram? Well, first thing you have to do is isolate the body or free the body from its environment. Um, for example, if you have a, uh, we'll call this a bracket. You have a bracket here and you have some board that you're putting a force on. Well, if we wanna figure out the reaction on the bracket, we will free the bracket from the environment. So we leave the bracket on its own and we show the resulting forces and moments that would come from our environment. Um, now determining, okay, what are those resulting forces and moments? That's something that takes a little bit of practice, um, something that you have to use your engineering skills and your engineering engineering intuition to kind of come up with. Um, there are definitely situations where you can make an argument as to whether a reaction does exist or whether for the analysis you're performing, if it's important enough to consider. Um, for example, for the analysis here, if we have three or four bolts on this surface, yeah, we might not care about the moment that's applied there. We might just care about the, um, the force here. Or if this moment arm is really short, let's say this is, you know, let's say this is an inch, right? We might not care about the moment that's applied here. Um, if it were 12 inches or 24 inches um, in about this scale, then yeah, we probably would care. Um, so the first step is to isolate the body, to free the body. Second step, 
I already showed here, but I actually haven't on my example here, is to put a coordinate system on your body. Last time when we made our coordinate system, we decided that it was good to put it in an important place. Um, so for this little example here, a good place, we'll, we'll draw these in blue. A good place is probably, uh, probably about there. We'll just say that it's centered on where our reaction is. Whenever you have coordinates, make sure you label your axes. Always label your axes. Um, in two dimensions, yeah, it might be kind of obvious, but sometimes in two dimensions, you actually draw your axes like this, or you'll draw them obliquely. Sometimes you'll see, ooh, it's going to look strange. Sometimes you'll see a coordinate system that looks like that. Um, and in three dimensions, this is definitely one you need to label. So, you know, who knows what these three are? Um, that's why you always want to put labels on them. Now, the third step is we draw forces. So when you're drawing forces, you both want to put the forces at about the right locations, and you also want to label them appropriately. Um, remember that reaction forces are a function of the constraint that we're applying on it. So um, for example, in this, in this scenario, we've got a reaction here. And if we were to draw these reaction forces, we would probably try and draw them like this. So remember that they're a result of the constraint that we're putting on our system. Um, this, this reaction that I've drawn here would be a fixture or a rough surface. Um, if you weren't at the last, uh, if you weren't at last week's, we, we were talking about how whenever you see in an engineering schematic, if you ever see a surface with diagonal lines coming off of it like this, um, this is usually, uh, usually means it's some fixed surface, something that um, you can expect to never move. And that applies far beyond statics. That, you use that for fluids, for thermo, um, even for dynamics, for pretty much, um, for the rest of your engineering career, you'll see this type of schematic to represent a fixture. Um, now, one thing that might not be obvious is the direction of your forces. So sometimes your reactions, you don't know what direction they're in. Um, sometimes the forces you're applying, you don't know the direction that they're in. If you don't know a direction, um, you can assume it. You have the power to do that. Um, when you're making a free body diagram, you're communicating that when I start my calculations, this is what I want to say. These are my assumptions. Um, and you're communicating to whoever is reviewing it later, which often is yourself, um, that this is what you were thinking. Um, if your direction that you assumed was wrong, uh, a lot of times when you get to the bottom of your, uh, if you get, when you get to the end of your calculations, if you have some, some number that's negative, it means that the force was acting in the opposite direction to the one that was drawn. In some scenarios, uh, this is important to, this is important, an important thing to note. Uh, well, it's always an important thing to note, to at least say forces on the free body diagram ended up being in the opposite direction as shown. In some scenarios, you'll actually be required or you'll be you'll want to redraw the forces in the other direction if you do have to do that you need to make sure that it's reflected in all of your equations um, if you if you have like if you have a free body diagram you did all your equations and you come out with a negative at the end you can't just erase the negative and redraw it um, that what that shows is that then all of your calculations have a negative error because all of your calculations would be using the force that was previously defined in another direction. So um, typically for statics, you can leave it as a negative answer. So for example, for this force, if I said this is force B, um, and I got down, got done with all my equations and I got uh, we'll say b equals minus 10, right? So I can just say this is b 
um, but it's acting in the other direction. And a negative vector, just to remind you that forces are indeed vectors, a negative vector is the same thing as a vector with the same amplitude, but in the opposite direction. Um, beyond assuming your direction, a lot of times we'll end up breaking up our forces into different components. Um, make sure that your components are appropriately labeled and you consistently use the same labels. So in this in Mello's example here, he says FAX is a force at point A in the X direction. What he means there is, let's say on our on our body here, we call this point A. Now, if we have a force, I'm going to do this in a different color. I'm getting kind of crowded here. If we have a force this way. I'm calling this force F of A. Or draw it bigger, it'd be F sub A. Um, because this is point A right there. So we'll draw that again down here. Down here is point A, and this is force F sub A. Then when I start to do my component analysis, when I'm when I break up this force into X and Y components. Then I'll call this F sub A X, and this will be F sub A Y. Um, sometimes you'll see the components already broken up in free body diagrams. And in fact, um, in the, the first example we're going to do, uh, we'll go ahead and leave them broken up. Um, it's just a matter of convention at that point. So uh, it, it depends on what's more important for you. If you care that something is truly acting in one direction or another, then you'll typically leave it as um, as direction. So let's say you have a bearing, right? Well, if I have a force acting radially, then I probably care that it's acting in this direction and not in the axial direction, because forces are designed to take or bearings, sorry, are designed to take loads or forces in the in these different directions in very different ways so in that case you'd probably want them separated however if you also if you had the same bearing but you were just looking at the pin here and you had say a reaction in the x and a reaction in the y for for just the radial load you probably care more about the total magnitude about this this total f than the two parts. Um, and that's because uh, bearings are typically rated for a radial load and an axial load. So this radial load, you, it doesn't really matter what direction it's in. It doesn't matter how the components resolve themselves. It, it, they could be like this. They could be really shallow. So you could have, um, you could have another one that's like that. All we really care about here is the total magnitude of f and again these are these are all valid ways of, of representing a force it just depends on your situation so now that we know how to make a free body diagram let's go ahead and start with our first real statics problem so on the baja car uh, one of the easiest, one of the simplest things to pull a statics problem from is actually the brakes. So this is a snapshot of the brake pedal. Um, the, this pedal actuates here. Um, so this will move back and forth. It'll rotate like that around this pin. Um, another one of these schematic things to think about, a pin is often drawn as a triangle, again, with those dashed lines under it. So basically, this shows that this part of the triangle is fixed, and this point, everything pivots about that point. Um, we can assume that this is all fixed. So this is all rigidly mounted to the chassis. So really, the um, 
the component that we care about analyzing here, um, or what we want to find out, is what load can our pin take? So we want to figure out the reaction on this pin. Um, so we're going to need we're going to need the reaction, the total reaction force. So this will be the sum of Ry and Rx. And what we care about is the total reaction R. Now, um, similarly, as I was saying with the bearing, with this pin, um, I think this is actually a, a quarter 20. What we care about and what we'll learn about um, maybe next week, um, or at least soon, is about uh, shear forces and how to calculate how strong something is or how much, how much stress we can put something under for a given load. Um, so what we care about is the magnitude of this resultant force, the magnitude of this reaction, because um, that'll tell us if our pin, the quarter 20 that this pivots about, is going to be strong enough um, to with, withstand the force on our pedal. Um, so for this scenario, what, what we've decided is that um, we had someone sit in the car and we put a, a strain gauge on here or a, a load cell would be more a more accurate way of saying this. So um, a load cell usually looks something like this. Um, and really, it's just a big, very well calibrated spring. Um, so from this load cell, we had someone put their foot on there. That's a, pretend that's a foot. <laughs> um, and we measured this force of 50 pounds, 50 pounds, acting right here um, in the center of the pedal face. Then we measured from the brake lines. So we had attached to the brake lines, we have um, pressure transducers. Um, and we happen to know the area inside of this cylinder. So pressure equals force um, force over area. So if we know the area and we know the pressure, we calculate the force. So we measured this force as being 190 pounds. 190 pounds. Um, I'll go ahead and clear this slide um, just to draw this a little clearer. So we've got a 50 pound force here from your foot and got a 190 pound force here that the brakes that the the brake lines are putting back on this pedal and then again we've got our our pin here so this is the point that's fixed so the question that we're wondering now is what load can our pin take so can anyone tell me um if if we're starting out here i went ahead and drew the figure um so i i already isolated the body for us um, we'll go ahead and draw our pin in here but what information do you guys think is going to be important for our analysis so we know there's a force here we know there's a force here um, in order to start trying to solve this um, what do you guys think is going to be important? And go ahead and just start, um, just start shouting out answers. Um, I know this will be a little. Uh, could, you, uh, could you give us the question one more time, Tyler? So um, the question was, um, for this scenario, um, what information, what other information am I going to need? So right now, all I know is this is 50 pounds. And this is 190 pounds. Um, and I'm trying to figure out the magnitude of these reaction forces. So what, what information do you guys think we need? Do you think we need something like materials or distances, dimensions? 
Um, Don't you need direction? Yeah, we'll need direction. That's one important thing. So for each of the forces. Yeah. So we've got direction for the forces. Um, what else? What's next? Isn't the uh, the brake pedal a moment arm? Yeah. So what do you what do you want for a moment arm? Uh, the distance between the fixed point and the force. Okay. What else? Anyone else have some other ideas? The angles of the forces. All right. We want angles of forces. All right. So um, you guys are all right. These are all these are all definitely things that we'll want to keep. Um, I'll go ahead and mute us again and mute myself again for now in Discord. Um, See, so we don't have echoing. Um, so yeah, so this is definitely something that we're going to want to use. Uh, so all of these are going to be important, which is why I measured them. So uh, <laughs> um, here we can see all of the different directions, all of the different angles, and a lot of our all of the distances that we care about. Um, so now that we have dimensions on our free body diagram, what's our next step? Um, so the next step, if I were mellow, I would say, ooh, you need coordinates. So I'm going to go ahead and put our coordinates right here. So I'll make these our coordinate axes. And we'll label those X and Y so that we know what directions we're talking about. So we've got X and Y. Um, this point seems interesting. So we'll, we'll do this point in black. So this point seems interesting. Um, because it's at the origin, typically you call the origin point O. Um, sometimes that can be confusing uh, if it looks like a zero. Um, so if you're using a set of Cartesian coordinates, you've got x, y. But if you say, oh, look at point O, that sometimes doesn't make sense. But for us, we'll say it's fine. Um, so we've got point O. I'll go ahead and label this one the applied force. So we'll label that point A. And this is our braking force. Um, this is also called the pedal force. Um, the uh, according to the, the SAE Baja rules, um, they define your pedal force as the force that your pedal puts on your braking system um, because people have different pedal designs. So rather than the pedal force being what you apply on the pedal, it's actually what the pedal applies on your brakes. Or in this case, F equal, uh, react, the, according to, uh, Newton's first law, every action has an equal and opposite reaction. So the the force that you apply on the braking system is the same as that the braking system, system applies onto your pedal. So um, we're going to call this point P for pedal force. All right, so I now have my points labeled. Um, now I should label my forces. So we said this was the applied force, so we'll call it F of A. Um, and you don't have to say F, like I could just call this A, or I could call it Q. Um, the name of your force doesn't really matter. I like to say F of A, or F of something, or, or for moments I would say M, O, for the moment applied at point O. Um, in reality, it doesn't matter as long as you're consistent. Um, I just like to do this because in my mind it's a little clearer that, oh, we're talking about a force here. So I'll call this F of A, call this one F of P, and now we need to draw reaction forces. So we already said that there's a pin here, um, but we've separated the body from the pin. So 
whenever you separate from a pin, you have two reaction directions. So we've got one reaction force. Um, do these in black so they show up a little better. Um, got our reaction force R. So like we said before, I'm just going to put R in this direction because I don't know what R looks like. I don't know if R is going down, up, left, right, sideways. I don't know. Um, so I'm just going to draw R randomly like this. Now, because I've drawn it like this, um, I think it's easier to think about R in components. Um, that way, when I do, when I plug things into my equations, so when I go sum of the forces in the x direction, sum of the forces in the y direction, um, it's fewer angles that I have to worry about. So I'm going to call, I'm going to split up this force, and instead I'm going to label it as two separate reactions. So we've got R x and in this direction we've got R y. Um, and that should be just about it. Um, that's everything that we need for our free body diagram. Um, so now we're ready to start solving the problem. Did I leave us a blank slide? I did. Okay. Um, so in order to start solving our problem, I'll actually duplicate this one. Um, let's see, we're working here. We'll go ahead and duplicate it. Um, so we can kind of see what's going on. So uh, the, the next step, before we start plugging stuff into our equations, we want to figure out what our knowns and unknowns are. Um, so if you were doing this on paper, uh, or if you're, if you're following along with notes, uh, you usually would say um, given. You would list your givens. So we'll say given, we list our givens, so we're given f of a, we're given f of p, um, and then if there are any other dimensions or stuff that are labeled with names on here instead of numbers, you'd probably list them under here as well. Um, but uh, since the only labels that I've put on here are f of a and f of p, um, those are, if we look back up the problem description, we've said this 50 pound force is F of A and this 190 pound force is F of P. Remember, we were only given the magnitudes of those. If, we're, if we were given the directions, um, then you would label these as vector F of A, vector F of P, because then it communicates that I know both the magnitude of the force and the direction it's in. Um, now, the, the directions that were on here are technically given to us, so you could kind of label it either, either way, um, but for now, we'll just label the magnitudes. So now that we know our givens, we need to know what we need to find. I mean, in order to do any analysis or design, we need to figure out what we're trying to calculate. So we're trying to find our y and our x. And ultimately, that will lead us to what we really want, which is the total magnitude of our reaction force. Um, so now that we know what we, what we have, we know what we need to find, um, we should list what our unknowns are. So currently, uh, we know f of a, we know f of p, we know r y, we don't know r y, we don't know r x. So now I'll write these over here. Um, we'll put our unknowns in a different category. So we'll say our unknowns are ry and rx. Now we can start working on our equations. So I'll go ahead and jump to this. Uh, we'll jump to this slide. Um, and you know, I'll go ahead and give us a blank slide to start working on. Okay. So we'll start with our sum of forces in x. 
So sum of forces in x equals 0. So if I go back and I look on here, let me label this f of a, this one's f of e, um, we can see that f of a is acting at this uh, th this is kind of our the triangle that f of a is acting in. So we can think of this, if we split this vector, this force, into its components, we have f a x and f a y. We care about what's acting in the x direction. So if you do some trig, you'll see that, um, I'm not going to do it here, but you'll see that this 30 degree angle is also the same as this angle here. Um, and that's just some geometry. It's, um, it's a, I'm assuming that this is perpendicular to this. Um, so the, the shared angle there is 30 degrees. So um, this we can treat just like a triangle. So this, the hypotenuse or the magnitude of our vector is f of a. Um, so if we just use some trig identities, we say f a x equals f of a cosine 30. Remember, cosine is the adjacent edge. And then f a y equals f of a sine sine 30. Um, so now we can split all of our vectors into their x and y components. So if we go back one more slide, we see that f of a acts a little bit in the x direction, um, f of p acts a little bit in the negative x direction, and r of x acts, we assumed it was the positive direction. We might be wrong, um, but for now we'll label it and we'll consider it as positive through our calculations. So we have f a x minus f p x, because remember it's in the negative direction, plus r of x, so we assumed it was positive, equals 0. So this will be 50, which is the magnitude of f of a, times cosine 30. This is, this is where using a mouse starts to get challenging. Um, and we do minus 190 which is the magnitude of f of p. This is also cosine. This is 45. Um, one easy way to think about cosine and sine, you look at your coordinate axes. Um, if you always assume this is x and this is y, then um, your x component will always be the cosine of your angle, and the y component will always be the sine of your angle. So here, um, even though our angle was, well, let's see, our angle was 45 degrees for fp of x, um, even though it's in the negative direction, this angle is still 45. So my x, my magnitude in x is still a hypotenuse times cosine 45. All right, so back up here. We've got fax minus fpx plus rx equals 0. So this equation will lead us to r of x, because we only have one unknown, and we have one equation, one unknown. We can solve it. Now, let's do the same thing for y. So the sum of f of y equals 0. So we have, again, this is f, y, x. And if we look back at our force here, we see f, p is also acting in the negative y direction, because it's going down. So this would be minus f, y, oh, sorry, f, p of y. Oh, whoops. Sorry, this is not f, y of x. That doesn't make any sense. This is f a of x. There we go. So f a of x minus f p. Oh dear. <laughs> All right. 
fa of y, because we're summing forces in y, fa of y minus fp of y plus ry, because again, we assumed the reaction was positive, equals 0. Um, and you can break that up into sines and cosines again. So this would be 50 sine 30 minus 190 sine 45 plus ry equals 0. And that'll give us our reactions in y. Now, my calculator is actually broken, and I'm not just saying this as a teaching element. Uh, well, not broken. It's not charged, and I don't have a cable that works with outlets here. So, <laughs> um, we'll take a minute or so. Um, and I want you guys to go ahead and solve, uh, solve for Rx and solve for Ry, um, and go ahead and tell me what you get. Um, there might be one more question that is, well, we, we, we plugged in f of x, f of y. Why didn't we do the sum of the moments? So why didn't we do sum of the moments equal to 0? Well, if we look back at our, at our, uh, our free body diagram here, we'll go to the, the cleaner one. Um, although we have forces acting at distances, um, we don't actually need to use that third equation because we've we already have two equations that describe what we're trying to find. All we're all our, our only unknowns are ry and rx. So we used this equation, some of the forces in x to find our x. We used this equation, some of the forces in y to find our y, and that's all we need to use. So while yes, you technically need to satisfy this equation um, we just we don't care we don't have any moments or any other forces to solve for so we can go ahead and leave this one off of our analysis and that's the the big reason that you list what you find what you're trying to find and what your unknowns are um, and just as a general rule of thumb uh, a rule of algebra you only need as many equations as you have on to calculate your unknowns so if you have two unknowns, you only need two equations. Two equations. Oh, that should be a Q. Two equations. You have three un unknowns or three unks. You need three equations. Now this is where things get interesting. Um, if I have a statics problem that has four unknowns, um, there are a couple there are a couple ways of trying to figure out what our, uh, what we can do to solve that, but we only have three equations. So we only have the sum of f of x equals zero, the sum of the forces in the y direction equals zero, and the sum of the moments equals zero. So because we only have those three, three equations, we have to use some other methods to get rid of that fourth unknown or to collapse it a little bit. Sometimes you'll use symmetry to do this. Um, Sometimes you use what's called a method, method of joints or a method of sections. Um, those we'll get into uh, a little later on in, in a couple weeks. Um, but for any given statics problem, unless you, unless you know more about the situation, you can only solve up to three unknowns. Um, when we start to get into, uh, when we start to get more unknowns, you're, you'll start to run into what's called problems that are statically indeterminate. And that's just fancy word for saying, or a fancy phrase for saying, we can't determine what all of our reactions or what all of our forces are just using statics. So you have to then start using mechanics and materials knowledge, or you have to use some other knowledge that you might have about your system. All right, um, I think I've given you guys enough time to solve these equations. Um, does anyone have answers for me? And I know there will be a little bit of lag, so don't worry about it. Uh, yeah, should I take both of them or one of them? Yeah, go, uh, 
Sure. Uh, Shanna, go ahead and, and give us the first one. Um, Rx is 91.05. All right. Rx equals 91.05 pounds. Um, you'll, you're probably, I mean, I'm sure you're familiar with significant figures. Um, we'll just use three sig fig or two sig figs since that's all we were given. We're only given 50 pounds. So we'll just call this, we'll just call this 91 pounds. Josh, do you have the other one? Nice. Pretty sure the second one should be uh, 109.35. All right, cool. Uh, you guys can uh, probably see where we're going. So 109.35 is about 109. Um, so now we have, I'll write these again here, Rx equals 91. Ry equals 109. So this is again uh, somewhere where we can use trig. So we've got the sum of two vectors, right? Rx and Ry. And we're trying to find the resultant here, R. So our total R, um, if we, we go ahead and move the, oh, Move, can I move this whole thing together? That'd be sweet. Ah, look at that. So if we add these up, uh, if we go tip to tail, we can see that they both add up there. Um, but uh, we can just use the Pythagorean theorem here. So we can just do um, R equals the square root of Rx squared plus ry squared. Someone have that ready? Someone, uh, can someone calculate that real quick? And while you're calculating, I'll go ahead and go back to here so we can see where we've come from. One forty two point zero zero. All right, one forty two. Cool. Okay, so, um, what did we do? What did we do for this problem? So we were looking for the load that our pin can take. We knew our applied force, and we knew the force measured from the the brakes so we knew that we had this applied force here this applied force there we also knew what the directions and locations of our forces were um, now notice we never actually used the locations um, and that's again uh, we look back here you can see that because we never had to sum any moments we actually didn't care about the dimensions there um, You'll often see in problems like this, you're only ever you only ever need to actually measure enough information to solve for however many unknowns you have. So when you're given when you're given a lot of information, you're given this all these extra dimensions. Um, a lot of times, it's good to kind of sit back and and think, okay, well, how many of these are red herrings? How many of these are just um, extra information that we don't need? because we got our answer and we didn't even have to use them. Um, so now that we have the magnitude of our reactions of our reaction, we can say 
is a quarter 20 bolt strong enough to take 142 pounds in shear. Um, I'll leave the, the shear, shear calculation for later on. Basically, the answer is yes, quarter 20, sorry, super strong. Um, it'll, it'll do that in a heartbeat. So it looks like, at least for this loading scenario, um, it looks like our brake pedal was de de designed effectively. Um, now, I was going to start us on a second, um, second example. Looks like we're getting close on time, but um, I think I think we can make it. I think we'll be all right. Um, so now we have another problem. So according to the SAA rules, um, your your pedal holder for your brakes has to be able to withstand a. Like I said earlier, you have to be able to withstand a 450 pound 450 pound pedal load. Um, now, when uh, when Kyle was designing these, he also wanted to make sure that all the brackets were going to be safe. So this is some some baby FEA that he did, um, but the load that he applied on here was a three thousand pound load at five degrees above the horizontal. Um, so we look if we look back at our picture here, um, this this component here, you can probably recognize it right there. Um, See if I can highlight it here. Highlight that right there. That's this component. Um, so basically, he in his FEA he def he uh, ran the calculation, um, saying that we have a three thousand pound load applied here at five degrees above the horizontal, five degrees, but not 50, five degrees. Um, and the other, the other um, consideration for this problem is that we, our pedal force is 450 pounds. So the force that we apply to the brakes and the force that the brakes apply back on us, this force here is 450 pounds. Now, um, one cool thing about the way our brakes work is the master cylinders are stationary. So that means this angle here, this angle here is always going to be the same. So this angle is always 45 degrees. Um, and if you want to see how that works, um, if you if you can open up the fusion model, um, it's actually uh, you can actually kind of move this back and forth and you can get a feeling for how this slides back and forth. Um, technically, there's also another component uh, in the, the direction that isn't shown here um, called a bias bar. And that's how we control how much braking pressure we apply to the front or the back. Um, but the the push rod, this, this piece here, the push rods always stay concentric with our master cylinders. They always stay at 45 degrees to the horizontal. Um, and the horizontal in this case is talking about the, the chassis floor. So it always stays at that angle. So now we have a new problem. Um, if we're applying the maximum load that it's rated for, and we have this reaction, well, we wanna know how hard can, does that mean the driver can push um, before they're going to basically before they're going to break this component um, or before the analysis that we did is no longer valid? Um, and then we also probably want to know, well, at what angle do we need to stop the pedal to prevent them from doing that? So how far can they rotate the pedal? How far? Can they push the pedal where their applied force becomes too great? Um, essentially, uh, when you rotate the pedal more this way, it applies more force this way, um, which is how the brakes work. Um, the farther you push them, uh, the farther you rotate this, 
the farther it pushes the push rods into here, which um, compresses the, the brake fluid more. Um, so I've already taken the liberty of starting a free body diagram for us. Um, and in the, in the name of time, I'll just kind of explain what's going on here. Um, so we have a, a, our unknown force. I'll label this again F of A because we don't know what our applied force is. We know that we have a 3,000 pound reaction. So R equals 3,000. Um, this time we do know the direction of R. So we know R is actually in the negative direction here. Um, so Rx is going to be equal to minus R times cosine of the angle, so cosine 5. Um, we don't have to necessarily work through the specifics there. Um, if you guys are interested, this will be a great problem to do on your own um, and to ask questions about for next time. Um, but we've got this, uh, we've got our applied force here. We've got the force from the brakes here. Um, now, one thing, one new thing is we don't actually know the location of this force. So we don't know where this is now. Um, one thing we can do from the previous problem is we, we did know these distances. So we can calculate this length. Um, this is the length between, or the, the distance between point O and point P. Point P, but these are no longer valid. So we'll th we can think of these as no longer being, these are no longer true. Because um, we don't know, we now have a new unknown, which is, ooh, what's a color, a new color. We have a new unknown. I'm going to use the straight tool so you can see this. New unknown, which is now this angle. I'll call it alpha. No, I'll call it theta. Theta is a better name for an angle. So um, this, uh, a big hint here is we know the distance. We know our distance to this point. So we know that um, we know our angle to the normal here. We know that th this force always acts at 45 degrees. We know the point at which it acts is related to theta um, by, uh, by the, the shape of our brake pedal. Um, and I think we're getting late enough that, yeah, I will make this a, an exercise for you guys to practice with. Um, so try and figure out using all of our equations, and another big hint, you will need all three, um, try and figure out what our applied force is and what angle it's being applied at now. Um, and this one will probably be significantly harder. Um, when you take the sum of your moments, um, remember that you can sum moments about any point it doesn't matter where it is, um, as long as you know perpendicular distances. Um, the other thing to remember is moments can also be broken up. So if you have you have something like that, and you know you have a point here, maybe you know the distance. Um, maybe you know this distance here, you know, the, the distance to that point. So you know D, and you know the magnitude of F, and you know this angle. This can be broken up into two separate moments. So you can break it up into a moment here, acting at D. So this would be F of Y, acting at a distance of D and another moment here that is 
f of x. I'll draw that in a different color so you can see it. f of x acting at a distance d. Um, now for this one, it cancels out because the x, uh, f of x is pointing in the same direction as d. In some cases, your d will be here and f of x will be like that. Um, so you will need to add both of them. But uh, I'll leave. I'll go ahead and leave that as an exercise, and um, we'll wrap up for today. Um, thanks everyone for joining. Um, this was the second uh, the second presentation on statics. Today we were able to just about finish static equilibrium in two D um, with that example problem for you guys to work on. Um, next time, we'll talk about distributed loads, friction, and static equilibrium in three dimensions. Um, and then we'll probably start working on some stuff from mechanics and materials. Um, yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed. I'll stick around on Discord if you guys have any questions. Um, or if you want to work on the example with me, that's fine. Um, but I think I'll go ahead and end the stream here. All right, talk to you guys later.